I never went with you on first. That one? Yep. Everyone show you a second. Yeah. Good. What do I do with that? Uh, Cancel it, though. Narrow it down. Yep. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Some friendly faces there, I can see. Some not quite so much. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That didn't last long, did it? It didn't last long. For the benefits of the microphone, we've already encountered some IT problems. Is it because I minimised the... Um... Yeah, right, yeah. I'm on with the presentation mode as well. You told me not to. It didn't work that well when we tried it last time, Bobby, so it's visible up on the screen at the moment, so we'll stick with that for now. Right. So, hello everyone. I've been coerced by Paul to come and speak to you today. Um, I started re regretting it the minute I said I would. <laughs> but there you go, I'm here now. So, my name's Mark Paget, as Bob said. Um, I joined the railway in 2003 on the um, track conversion programme. Having uh, worked in engineering beforehand, and I've been asked to present today on um, how to maintain SZ geometry. So, as I said, um, I started from outside the railway. There was a um, rail track had a program called the Track Engineering Conversion Program. They called us Boil in the Bag Engineers. We had like a three month course in Derby. We was all worked for rail track. We were supposed to go into a depot and um, be like man for man marking against like Balfour or Jarvis or, or whoever it was. So I got the job as uh, going into Guildford Depot. Should have been quite a, a nice little number, really. But, uh, within a month or so, Railtrack decided to pack it in. Uh, the contract was taken back from um, Balfour Beatty for Wessex, and I'll become ATME within about two months of uh, landing. So I was in trouble straight away. So the first thing I had to do uh, was... Uh, as a rail track person, my job was to analyse the traces coming off the train. So the train would run every six months or three months. And uh, paper copies would come off really old fashioned. And I had to uh, take those, photocopy them, um, say where the repeat faults were, look for um, degrading trends, improving trends, <coughs> photocopy it all three times, send one to Waterloo, one to Woking and keep one. And uh, every now and again, I'd have to write a report stating um, the change in the asset as I saw it. And also, occasionally, I'd have to um, write a report if something went bad. So we had one particular day when we had a 36-hour twist on a set of breathers down by Wombra. And I had to go and present to the area track engineer of why this had happened, Nigel Wilson which I didn't enjoy very much. <laughs> so uh, a couple of months later, the train was running again. So I rung up the track chargeman, who I knew was working around there, and asked him to go down and have a look at these breathers, because I was worried about the train, and I didn't want it to happen again. So he's rung me up the next day, and he said, that train you were worried about has just gone past me. I said, OK. He said, and it stopped up the track. I said, oh, that a signal? He said, no. <laughs> it's just stopped. <laughs> so it turned out that um, he'd eyed in the high rail, lifted it up, can go packed it. He was just about to bring the other rail up to suit when the train went past. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's happened to me. So I learned not to cheat the train. A couple of minutes later, I had a commotion in the office next door. The supervisors, SMs, obviously get the call for control. So I went to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> So I uh, stayed at Guildford for a couple of years and ended up down at Clapham, much, much to my better judgment, very difficult down there. And it was a totally different environment to Guildford and um, very, very tricky patch. So we had uh, two block the line twists within a couple of months of each other, one on the A13 bridge down at Waterloo and one at Barnes. They were both real, both proper faults. So um, 
I knew we was in a bit of trouble down there. So I decided to review the highest repeat fault we had. Start with that one. So I, there was a repeat 22 alignment fault on Barnes Bridge. It's a six monthly recording. So it's been there 10 and a half years. I knew it's a wheel timber bridge. It's going to be difficult, isn't it? It's going to be terrible. So I went up there with all my survey gear to go and look for it. Walked over the bridge, all looked OK. Looked, I just passed the bridge on the ballast and I saw a kink in the rail. So I went and looked at that and there was a rail in there, 10 and a half years old, with no nylons in all the way down the outside of it. And it had been like that for 10 and a half years. So that taught me one thing that it doesn't, like these faults, they don't have to be difficult to fix. They can just be ignored and left down. So I decided I would um, go and see them all. So I went out with um, all the gangs and the team leaders and saw what they did and what they didn't do. And obviously some people there were really good. Anyone remembers Ricky Hart, the track chargeman down there, he, the legendary man he was. Obviously anything that he fixed stayed fixed. Some of the others, not so much. So we decided to uh, start tackling the problem one at a time. So we set up a uh, track geometry gang and uh, they just done that non-stop. And um, me and um, the PTOs, the ATMEs, uh, asset inspectors, we'd try and do one every two weeks ourselves. So we'd go out on a Thursday or a Monday whenever we had a block and we'd try and fix one. You know, if we could fix one, that's one less. So they didn't always work well. So we had an alignment fault down at Barnes on a bit of S&C. I tried to slew it over. I couldn't slew it over. So we put another slewing jack in, still couldn't slew it over. So I decided to put one in the cess. Triple. Started to go and it was OK. And then a train went through. So I let all the pressure off the jacks. The train come through and the one in the cess picked up every Comrail shoe as a 12 car train went through. <laughs> <laughs> and welded them to the web around. So that wasn't so good. So, <laughs> and, um, so one by one, though, we did start to uh, repair the faults. And uh, this is a chart from 2008 or something. And they did start to improve. As you can see, the lines coming down there. I'll pick this one in particular. You know, there were other shots that didn't look so good. But it started to get better. But because we was fixing them so slowly, because we was MSPing and trying to do it properly, uh, it turned out that every time the train run, we'd have two from last month that hadn't been done, and then four, and then eight, and then 12. So the numbers started to go the wrong way. Everyone was panicking. Everyone in the depot was panicking. I was panicking. But in the end, it turned around, and um, I, I just kept putting STNCs in. They got agreed because the, the plan was seen to work. And in the end, uh, they come all the way down. And at the point I left, we ended up with no twists at all on Clapham. I don't know what it's like now, it's probably even better, hopefully. <laughs> so after that, I, I got a job with Mr. Meads here on Wessex. This was about 2010. So I was asked to go out and uh, try and do the same sort of thing across the rest of the um, area, which was really good. I've been outside of um, my area. So I was down in sort of Salisbury and Basingstoke and Woking and all these nice places, you know, a little bit better than Nine Elms and the places <laughs> I've been working. So the idea was I'd go out, scope up faults, work with the gangs, do a week with them or two weeks or two days, whatever I had to do, and um, try and get the faults fixed. So, um, yeah, so that was that. So after that, I went to Angley Root, Nigel Wilson, if anyone knows him. And we had, uh, I, well, I didn't realise his Anglia had the worst twist faults in the whole country. And it had the worst repeats. And um, I was told to investigate and implement a solution. My time all right? Yeah, you're doing fine. Yeah, absolutely. So that was in 2016. That might have been Andy Jones, was it, in the track then? Coming. Oh, 16, 16, 16. Anyway. Yeah. So there was an angry route there, 272 repeat twists out of 409. So 67% of them were repeating. So that's not good. 
So I went and see over a quarter of them. I went to about 120 sites, took me three months or whatever. And um, I was asked to categorise them because they wanted to price up the um, how much it cost to sort the track out. And 47% of them were just down to poor workmanship. There was nothing really wrong when I went there. It looks okay, the sleep was okay, the joint was okay. So I couldn't see anything wrong, it just hadn't been fixed properly. So it shouldn't cost anything, you should just have to do it again. 30% of them had been just roughly packed, can go when it should have been MSP maybe, but just not enough work. And it was only 9% um, of them that actually, you know, needed sort of block item work, you know, big sleepers, lots of work, big wet beds or whatever. And then I found that half of the repeats were within s &C. So half of the 272 rule in SNC. So I thought that's where I needed to concentrate my efforts. So the problem I found going out with the gangs is that it's a difficult job. It's um, a skilled job, but it's not really seen as that. People giving sort of 10 to do in a day when really they could probably only do one or two. There's various options that the team leader can take. But generally speaking, as good as they are, they're unsupervised. So often they just go for the easiest one, especially if they've been given five or 10 to do in a day. Measure shovel packing I knew to be the best way of doing it, because that's what we've done at Clapham and it worked, but no one was doing any measured shovel packing because it's a bit difficult. And measured shovel packing in S&C is about as difficult as it gets. You've got lots of things that can go wrong. Um, it's a bit scary especially when you see it, when you're doing it under traffic. So that was the stem of the problem, I think. So I, I knew, I think I knew how to fix them, but I wanted to look at the research and find out uh, if there was any written documentation. So I looked everywhere in network rail stuff and there was nothing about MSP and in S&C. There was a little bit about plain line, but when I looked at that, it was wrong anyway. The date and rail was wrong. Some of the numbers were wrong. I did um, mention it, but no one changed it. <laughs> um, I looked at a BR training, stuff I could find that I'd nicked from around the depots over 20 years, and I couldn't see anything in there. There was a bit in there about uh, marking up for tampers, but nothing about um, what I needed. I looked at the old PWI books. Someone gave me that old issue five, which was really good, and it didn't have anything in there. So it seemed to me that it was just too hard to write down, so no one had bothered. So the task, as I saw it, was uh, I had to research how to do it. I had to isolate any errors that are in the system already. So there's a reason why people are fixing them and they're coming back. Something must be going wrong. I need to find better methods of doing it. I needed to produce a training package and um, make it so people can understand it. I needed to adapt it so people other than me could understand it. It's okay me understanding it, but if you tell other people and they don't get it, then it's no good. I need to test it because um, afterwards, if somebody uses your method and the fault doesn't get fixed, then your method's no good. Then I needed to train the people out to do it. And then I needed to check it was okay. So what I ended up with was um, a booklet that I produced. It was like a 70 page booklet. It's got one here. It sounds a lot, 70 pages, but it's big writing and a little book. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's basically supposed to go in your pocket and be used at three o'clock in the morning when it's raining. So you've got to be able to read it. And uh, I tried to go through everything from start to finish about how you're supposed to do it, um, what could go wrong, what survey equipment you've got. So I'm not going through the whole booklet, but uh, the essence of it was that uh, what I found was there's, there's errors um, within people's knowledge what was leading the, re the uh, faults to repeat. So measure child packing is measured. That's what it is. You have to have the measurement before you start. So the measurement has to be correct. So the tin of the um, the canister that you use, it's a two mil canister. So is it like the tin of Ron seal? 
Does it say, does it do exactly what it says on the tin? Remember the advert, wrong seal, does what it says on the tin. Do you get two mil then out of one of these? All right, yes, I'm not so sure. So one of the things I noticed was that um, the old chipping tin I remember seeing when I first started had a slot in it. Do you remember that, anybody? It was about that far down. And the new ones don't have a slot in it. So the people who buy them didn't know that it was supposed to have a slot in it, or maybe it was a bit cheaper not to cut one in. And what I discovered reading back through the old books is that slot was to distinguish between plain line and S and C. So a, a full tin of chippings is for an S and C bearer. It's not for a plain line bearer. S and C bearer is a 300 mil wide. Plain line bearer is a 250. Concrete are even narrower. They're all funny shapes. So the idea was that the people who used to know what they was doing, if they was doing plain line, they would um, fill it up to the slot. If they were doing S&C, they'd fill it to the top. Nobody knew that anymore. It doesn't really matter as such if you're just doing a load of plain line. If you're supposed to pick, uh, pick it up by 30 mil and you put 20% too much in it, yeah, that'd be 36. But the 20 is 24, the 10 is 12, the 5 is 6. It doesn't really matter. Where it does matter is in S&C because you're going from the S&C bearers to the plain line bearers. So the difference is a 20% difference if you go from the, either you put too much in the plain line or not enough in the S&C. So most of the faults that I saw when they repeated were in and around the change of the bearers. So what I taught the blokes to do, the not the blokes, the, the workers to do, sorry about that, it's showing me age now. It's just use your feet, use your boots. I've got size nine feet. They are the same size as a plain line bearer. That, oh no, sorry, they're bigger than a plain line bearer, but they're the same size as an S&C bearer. So when you walk through the site, you have to walk over the sleepers to be measuring it and putting your gauge on. So you see what sleepers you've got and you have to adapt the lift you put on for the bearers. So if you've got 10 bearers in the plane line and only three in the um, s &C, you need to put more in the s &C than you do the plane line. If it's the other way around, you have to put less in the s &C, otherwise it'll void. As soon as you left, it won't void when you see it there, but it takes a day to run in. But if you go back the next day, it will be flapping. Same for breather switches. That's why they always uh, void if you're MSP because they've had 20% less lift. The other thing um, uh, I noticed when uh, I went back to the sites and they was um, unrepaired, shall we call them, was they was always voiding in the same places. The healer switch, the, uh, the area around the crossing, and um, the, the gut rails when things start to change. And the reason for that is because the packing area not only is it 300 mil, it's it's 375 each side of the sleeper. So if you look, for example, on the top left there, that's the place at the heel of the switch where you can't get the shovel in. It's not wide enough to get the shovel in. But if you wanted 20 mils worth of lift there, that would be 10 tins of chippings, five each side. Basically, you've got the whole middle area with a hole for the chippings to run into. So you need 50% more in there than the number you've got written down. If you don't put 50% more in, you'll get 50% less lift. And if it was 20 mil, then you're half weightable to get your twist back. That'd be the same as the um, various areas around the crossing. The crossing would need 125% uh, under the nose. It needs 150% at both legs. And when you get back out to the uh, to the area where you can get shovel in, you actually need to double up. If you don't double up, you've left a hole, and as the chip as the train goes over, all the chipping's going. So that was uh, the second reason I thought that the repairs weren't sticking. Oh, this is where I grimace because it's complicated. It's even more complicated. Oh, right, yeah. Than this bit. <laughs> yeah. So this is an, uh, another bit here where uh, obviously the s and got long bearers in and um, people are frightened of lifting them because it affects the other road. 
Uh, we've got lots of rails on there. But um, generally speaking, if you can go packing in there, all you do if you needed to pick that up, if you put the jack under F, say if it's 20 mil down, you just jack it up until it reads zero. You wouldn't know how much you've lifted it because you're just waiting for it to go from 20 to zero. That the not millimeters are only change over the four foot. And once you've lifted that up there, you could just pack it, couldn't you? As they say, Robert's your mother's brother. You know, Bob's your uncle, lift it up and it will be fixed. If you're gonna MSP that, then you need to measure it. So if I put my gauge on there between E and F, it would show I was 20 mil down. But if I put my gauge between C and E, it would show I was 20 mil down. And if I put my gauge on between A and C, it would show I was 20 mil down. So the 20 mil lift that I think I need at F is not 20 mil at all. It's actually 60 mil. Because it's 20 between A and C, another 20 between C and E, or C and D, and another one between E and F. So we'd actually need to lift that by 60 mil. Of all the people I went out, watched, do the packing, not one of them put 60 mil of chippings when it was 20 mil down. Why would you? So in, uh, in order to um, help them assess this, I've tried try to come up with a, like a modular way of doing it. So what I would tell them to do, because they've only got four foot gauge, they haven't got a five foot gauge and a six foot gauge and a three foot gauge, we only give them one bit of kit. So when they put the, uh, the gauge on between A and B there, they might need a 12 mil lift. If they also put the gauge on between C and D, it would also be a 12 mil lift. But we know that's not the actual lift you need. So the pro what we tell them to do, what I told them to do is they look on the track and they see how far across the four foot they are. Is it another quarter of a four foot, half a four foot, three quarters of four foot? Because the rails go from left to right. Then they, they, they start together, they end up together, and then they gap as they go through. So when they get to that point, they need to assess the lift in between A and B and see how far that rail is across. Is it closer to A or closer to B? And put the lift they need on there. If they don't put the lift on there, it will just have a gap and it will void and all the chiffings will come out. Once they know where the lift is there, they can write that on there. It becomes like a new datum. And then they can add that to the cross level and they find out that they need 18 mil. So if they hadn't have done that, they would have been six mil out. So that works all the way across the four foot. It, was a, it would be the same situation as you go further towards the crossing, but the further you go there, the bigger the difference is. So for the same uh, pizza, <laughs> <laughs> it would be, uh, it'd be the same for um, the 12 mil, this further down would be 21. Yeah, so it's almost double. So obviously when they're doing the work here, They need to graduate between the two situations. So what I teach them to do on site is they, as they go through the site, they get their yellow chalk out on the uh, on the clips and they mark up all of these areas. I've told them the, the 150 percent of the heel of the switch, the, the uh, double uh, when it separates a bit further, the quarter of four foot, the half of four foot, the three quarters of four foot. So when they're looking at their, with their torch at night or up and down, they can see where these places are. And they just have to graduate between the two. So if you're between the quarter four foot and half a four foot, obviously the bit in between is more than half and less than a quarter. The bigger numbers you're putting in there, the more careful you are. If you're only lifting it 10 mil, it hardly matters anyway. If you're lifting it 30 mil, then these uh, numbers get more important. Uh, when we're at the heel of the switch, then uh, that needs to go down in, in 5%, so 100%. Is at the uh, is at the front of the switch, 150 at the back where they have to do the three and two packing, and then I'll, they write down 145, 140, 135, 130 all the way down the switch, and when they go through, they can just tap that into their phone with the lift time to number. Yep, so the same thing happens when you go through the other side of the crossing. As you go through the other side of the crossing, the numbers get even bigger, get scarier and scarier. 
because the, the, the uh, timbers are getting longer and longer. So where you put your forefoot on, the next rail you can't get to. There's nothing to measure it off from your own datum. So they have to add in there another quarter of their lift or another half of their lift, depending on where they are. And at some point, they will end up at a um, their last long bearer. And then effectively, you're in two tracks. So how do you get those lifts out? So you might have at the back of that crossing, you might start it off with a datum rail lift of 10, cross level of 20. So you've got 30, then you need another quarter on there to get over onto the end of your bearer. So you're on 35, whatever it is, 37. Then you've got 37 mil that you've got no datum for. That's your last lift before it goes off to somewhere else. We always get the, the big twists in the crossovers, like the main line gets recorded every month and they get fixed. The, the branch line gets recorded every six months and by the time the train goes over it, we realise we're in a hell of a load of trouble. So they always need a big lift. So how do they get the lift out on the back of the crossing when they've got 37 mil? What do you do with it? Most of the gangs I spoke to, they just said, oh, I, some of them said, oh, I go lose five every sleeper. Some of them would go one. Some of them just didn't know. But you need a way of doing it. So uh, the sighting gear that you get, sighting boards, they come with these shims, after shims, they're eight mil down to one mil. They're metal, they're nice and long, they sit under the um, sighting boards. Nobody ever uses them. I think they're about 300 pound. I've never, I'm the only one I've, I've, who's ever used them, I think, unless someone says different. But what I decided to do is I, I used them to put my target board on. So I knew I needed, say, 30 mil at the back of the crossing. So I put 30 mils worth of um, shims, put my target board on it, take my sighting board down, and then I can eye back in, and I'll have a lift from zero to my 37, and I've run it out. What they're actually supposed to be used for is overlift, for cyclic top and things. So when you're looking on your sighting boards, you know when you get there and you say down, 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 and you're already at zero, and everyone says, ah, don't worry about it. You are supposed to worry about it. You're supposed to put these shims underneath and raise it all up so you get positive numbers. Um, but just using one of them, you can run out. Oh, four slides there. That's how many times? Yeah, time's absolutely fine. Yeah. So the, the other issue I found where people wasn't, uh, weren't packing sufficiently was when the lifts that you needed to get your twist out were getting so great if you went across the... Um, the six foot, you could end up with 70, 80 mil on the other road. No one's doing that under traffic. Well, definitely not anymore. But even then, no one's going to do that. So I needed a way of back calculating a lift. So if I knew that I had a twist of, say, 15 mil, and if I took that 15 mil out, I'll end up with 70 on the other road. I can't be doing that. What about if I go for a 10 mil twist, you know, which um, the train wouldn't find? I can tamp it later or have another go. If I back calculated and ended up with 10 mil, what would that be on the other road? So that way I can go and sight in the other road because it's bound to be in a dip, has to be in a dip, otherwise the, the bearers can't be going in that direction, can they? They can't be going down forever. So I come up with some calculations about putting the uh, sighting boards on the, um, on the far rail, the, the set rail right the other side. And how, how you work back, so you need 70% on the uh, six foot rail, then you need 30% uh, on your um, other six foot rail. Or if you didn't fancy doing that, you could sight and board onto the six foot rail, and then you need a 60 and a 40. If those lifts weren't good enough, then I could put my shims back in, overlift the other road by 10 mil, and then sight back in and bring it across. Um, Yep, so that's uh, that's in the book. The other issue that um, you can often find is in um, double junctions or crossovers, where you get the track has um, uh, gone into like a, what would you call it, like a sag in the middle, both crossings are down. So when you uh, put your cross level on one rail, it, it's down, and when you put cross level on the other rail, it's also down. So you can't aggregate across. 
So I'll come up with a way of doing that with um, do it using two lots of sighting boards, one on one set rail, one on the other set rail, pick them up straight. Now I could then put my track gauge on and I'll find a cross level to get to zero or 10 or whatever the junction was. And then all I've got normally is another couple of rails in there. But I know already that I've got a known lift on the set rail. I've got a known lift on another rail. I've got a known lift on another rail. All I need to do is see where the rail that I can't measure is in relation to the other two numbers. So if I've got a 17 on one and a 25 on the other, all I've got to decide is, is it closer to the 17 or the 25? How much do I want to put under there for it to be straight? And you can do that on every um, on every base plate, get a number out of it. That is a lot of work, though. I've done that a couple of times on a double junction, and just marking it up is four or five hours, let alone trying to... Um... Anyway, yeah. I think, oh no, mate, I've got one more, I think. Oh yeah, so the outcome. The outcome was that, uh, this was on Anglia quite a few years ago, I think you were still there then, Bob, that we got down, repeat twist down from 272 down to 69. Um, and out of the 69, 41 of them was on one TME area. So um, I think that meant there's nothing wrong with the process as such. The, the numbers would have been better. Um, but there you go. Well, it's actually it's, it's written on there. I should, probably should have blanked it out. <laughs> but the the uh, the improvement didn't cost any money as such. There was no we didn't have any gangs in. It was only the people on track. All it was chippings and a shovel, and um, and some shims. And that's it. Any questions? Where do we start? I'll take the chairman's prerogative, Mark. The, the coplanar situation through S and C. How do you work that? Just working straight across from one road to another. If it's on zero or whatever the can is. Yeah. So all I do is uh, if I've I I put the gauge on and I know what lift I need. And then I, I'm um, what's that called? interpolating that lift to the to the rail on the inside. So I know I've got um, say say if it's easier if I've got zero on the datum rail, and then I've got twenty on another. I just see the distance between and add that on, and then that number becomes what I add to the cross level for the other rail. The only time you have to do any different is when you've got a datum rail lift. And you, if I've got a date and round, I'm lifting the whole thing by 20, then I can't use that number as a percentage because it's not a real number. I have to use the cross level number and then add the, the date and rail on after, which um, sometimes uh, people don't do, and we end up in a bit of trouble. Is that what you meant? Yeah. yeah. How do you deal with warp timbers? Well, I think that I've only ever seen a few. Most of the time, I think they're just a bit bowed and a bit sad and sorry for themselves. Generally speaking, when I put the jack on it and lift it up, the whole thing doesn't come up. To me, it, it unbows itself. It straightens itself out, and I just uh, stick the chippings under. The S&C &C, stone blower wouldn't think, oh, that bear is a bit bowed, I'll leave it alone, so I don't either. I just go for it. But it, it does make it flap a bit. For a, for a day or so. Just got to be, well, you know what they say about MSP and never look back. Yep. It's too scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to I'm gonna chip in. Oh, no, I wish I hadn't said that. I'm going to ask questions. Chip in. Too um, shy. Um, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned in particular how long it could take to survey something like a double junction, but you also, which would be longer than a shift in itself, depending on how much access you had. But you also mentioned about how much time could be given to the turnout route compared to the through route. How do you how do you phase that? How do you calculate what to tackle, especially if you're if you're time limited? Well, yeah. So 
Well, yeah, it's a difficult one, really. So one of the things is you need to know that you've got all the equipment there. So um, I sadly went through about six bags of chippings with a, with a canister and emptied them out into a, well, down the bank to find out how many was in there. So I know how, many, how much lift I get out of each bag because otherwise you can start the job and run out of chippings and then you're in all sorts of trouble. So I think the phasing of it is if you have to do it in two goes, you make sure you don't do what matey done to me down at Wombra and lift the wrong round. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you, you take the twist out first of all, or lessen it, and then uh, you have to leave it a couple of days and go back. Um, but often the best way of doing it is, um, is marking it up, somebody to mark it up. So the way I used to try and do it is me and somebody else, you need two people with sighting boards, We'd go and mark a load up one day, and then other people would start fixing them, and then I'd go back round behind and um, try and mop it back up. That's what we had to do at Clapham, because we couldn't get any voids. So we had to put the void meters out day one, pack it day two, and then take the void meters to site three, and just keep going round like that. Um, is there any questions, any other questions? Oh, excellent, we've got some questions in the room before I go to the chat. Um, you mentioned the S&C stone lower. How many are there, and how often do people get to see them? I think they're free. Uh, they're quite old. Um, I, they're they're uh, I, the one on the Anglia used to use. I think it was Anglia in East Midlands. So I, there's, is there ten routes or nine routes? Nine. So not many for what there is. Not many for what there is, and also um, the stone blower doesn't cater for the situation with me shovels. So it always takes more than one go for the stone blower to ride the track because I asked the bloke from Harsco how we can, yeah, they don't add any more stone in. They, he wasn't aware that they were supposed to, but apparently the new ones are going to. And ideally, you want to run them in tandem. Yes. For a, yeah. a well, the way you would do an SEC town, yeah, you used to have the two going through together. You really yeah. want to do the two SMC stone blowers. Yeah, they, there's only three for the country. That's a bit difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I think there's some more fine. coming. Was there? I thought, I don't know if I, yeah, I could be wrong. Now. Yeah, and then, I'm not sure if it's got... there's yeah. another load coming apparently. Um, probably CP7, everything CP7, isn't it? Jam mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, how does it work with two leveling? Doesn't make any difference, but I don't think that no. you know, um, if like if you do a track design. It, you know uh, what the base plate is, so you can work out where the sleeper space. But as far as packing it manually, you're, you're only putting it to cross level. So as long as the two leveling plates in there and it's correct, and someone hasn't renewed the crossing, and like we did down at Guildford, and forget the uh, two leveling, then it doesn't really matter. I don't think. No, I don't think it matters. I've done Shelford Junction, and that was alright. Unless I'm, well, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't matter. <laughs> Any other questions in the room before? Oh, Mr. Ross? Oh, when, you, when you go to these locations, do you use, do you be putting it back to a camp that's there on the track, that's, you know, with the camp markers, or were you just blending it into the existing track situation? Yeah, so this is, I'll go through it with a lad when I do it. So it's in the book, I think, but the it depends what the situation is. So. If you can put it back to design, you do, but they're not machine. They can't do 20 chains. So if it's all down 30 mil across the whole bank, yeah, you can only make it better. So um, I make sure that um, it gets closer to design, obviously, and it's compliant for the, for the next train. Because it's, um, it's terrible if you go out to one and it comes back, especially if um, you've been giving it a big and that you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> So uh, there was one, there was one down at Wandsworth where the P way had written Paget's twist all over it, <laughs> all, all over it, all painted where all over the bridge, arrows on the platform and everything. So because um, I missed it, so what can you do? Um, we we have a question from Julian Heathcote in the chat. Julian, would you like to ask your question? Take that to know, so I'll ask for you, Julian. Um, so, um, I'll just get into the side. Apologies for that. You caught me out. Oh, sorry, Julian. Oh, wait. Yeah. Sorry about this. Um, I'm, I might have missed this. Obviously, you've 
first recommendation for guys in your area. It's absolutely brilliant. Sounds like a very good process. And has this been sort of like spread out around the whole network rail? Is the first half of the question. Um, no, not such. So um, it's been shown to um, Robert Ampermire when he was head of track. So he sort of validated it. I showed it to Bob and Nigel who, who thought it was OK. So no, not really. Um, it's probably not ready to be a TWI as such. Probably need to sort of finesse in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's been used on Wessex, Sussex, Anglia, North and East. That's about it. You've done a lot of briefing of it when you're going around to locally. Yeah, I'll probably yeah, I'll probably been out with forty or fifty gangs doing it. But uh, mostly so the thing is all a good idea then, yeah, the, the process. No no one shouted yeah. that. Yeah, so some some people um some people haven't liked it so much, um, which is fine. So I say to them, if what they're doing sticks, then that's fine. And if, if what they're doing doesn't stick, then maybe they should try what I'm doing. But some it, there's a few numbers in there that people get a bit um, can get a bit confused with. Mm -hmm. So if you t if you're one of those people, I just make sure I take the chalk off them and. and uh, <laughs> Give it, give it to one of the younger gang members who are normally uh, people who play darts are normally the best people. They're normally good with them. <laughs> they, they can add up better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. That's that's very informative. Thanks a lot. Any other questions at all? I've got another one on the phone, Mark. Um, I was picking up on Julian's point there. Is it? I think it's something we should definitely progress. You know, as a TWI. <laughs> Well, I took it to uh, we TLG. Could, uh, you know, with the animation and that, we've mm. got some of the other videos. That'd be fantastic. You know, like you say, there's distinct lack of yeah. detail on this for years. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, I took it to TLG about six months ago, and um, it didn't really get a lot of traction. So. Maybe we can push, maybe we can push <laughs> it again in a different way, mm. really. It seems so sound. You, the successes that you've achieved with it, it's hard to dispute yeah. it as a, as a method, is it? Exactly. Is it? No, absolutely. Otherwise, we, we're in danger of you know, repeating history and just losing that, that knowledge. Yeah, um, the question I was going to ask, Mark, is the people that you've, the people that you've been out with, have they, have they all had some form of MSP training? Mm. If they have, has that been good enough as an introduction, or have you had to take people to first principles? Yeah, so yes, but a bit of both really. So um, the idea is when I <coughs> normally when I'm speaking to the SM is uh, um, I ask for people who can already do it because this is like an extra. Mm. Um, but yeah, sometimes when I've been out, I've, I haven't been out to go through it at all. I've just had to do the basics of plain line mm. and then said um, I'll come back in in a few months. The other thing I'll try and do is, if I can, is I'll try and train people as a gang so they can um, get their courage off each other and, and check each other. Because when you're going through with the numbers yeah. and whatever, sometimes you get a bit confused. Yeah. Sometimes you're just having a bad day. And if, if you um, do this wrong, it really it can, it can, be, can be quite bad. Um, so you have to be confident with it. Um, but the, like I say, the video, I think, on the, um, what they call it, the standardised task video, it, I don't think it's quite right. Um, so that doesn't help. Mark, well, you said that gangs often get 10 a day to rectify, but mm. using this process, you're lucky if you get two done. How much do you think standards are driving poor quality in that respect? Because I, I guess a lot of these requirements are to be done within 36 hours or yeah. 15 days or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that a lot of sections don't want to MSP because they know how labour intensive is. Compliance is king, isn't it, as you know, so um, they don't want to go overdue. Um, it depends on your route engineers. If they're um, open to it, 
they, they give you a few TVs to allow you to improve these, don't they? On Anglia, we come up with a um, like a macro-enabled spreadsheet that spread all the dates of all the L2s based on their limits. So if you had a twist that's 15.1 millimetres, like why would you do it 14 days? So we, we spread them all out. So some of them doubled in time, so, but some of them, like the time come in. So if you're almost at a 36 hour twist, why would you still do it in 14 days? You really should be doing that in four days, shouldn't you? Yeah. And um, that that helped, because it just jam spread all the work and didn't really put any risk in. Well, it, there's always a risk in there, but no perceived risk. Mm. But I'm, I'm not sure when um, they've got a new system, Tiger and whatever, I don't know. It, it doesn't really um, like spreadsheets. <laughs> so. yeah. But that's an important thing to take up nationally, isn't it? Because I believe that's an issue. I yeah. think 15.1 isn't going to be that much more risk yeah. than 15. Yeah. Well, they're looking now for uh, UGMS, aren't they? They're looking for changes now rather than that's what they want, isn't it? It's to look for um, what's degrading rather than where it's sitting. It could have been like that for 10 years, couldn't it? But I think we're a way away from that, personally. It's been looked at, but not really not really from a national point of view we, there's pockets of good practice in introducing those sort of phased approaches to to um to twist faults kent have done some stuff in that area and i'm probably doing a disservice to others who, who um who've done it as well it's been looked but it's not sort of a it's not a collective initiative it's not the buy-in we kind of we're looking to expand it certainly from a region point of view we're looking to expand it to just do some analysis because you've got plenty of data there to give you an understanding that you can take comfort levels but not really a not necessarily a big doing people a disservice, but we're trying to take it forward locally because of what can be gathered in terms of in introducing that incremented approach. Yeah. Um, well, I kind of just thought like a quick fix sort of things. What's your opinion on packing schemes for S and C? And how it links to this? Because the packing on the top. The packing scheme, yeah, the um, packing pieces. Because like areas like Waterloo. The ladder, like through there, where it's so sort of tied in and kind of like that chasing out thing, time consuming. Yeah, what's what's your view on them in terms of like a? Like I'm, a quick yeah, I'm totally against them. I've never yeah. seen them work long time, long term, because there, there's something wrong in there for it to have pushed down. Mm -hmm. When you put that packing piece on the top, it's all right for a month or so, and then it just pushes down even worse, and everything gets more and more out of line. So uh, I, I've done one of these up at. Um, Barking, and if they had, um, I don't know, 40 mil of packings, all different shapes. Some of it looked like they'd come out of B and Q. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, no, oh no, I want to say, you know, the, 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 the fly, the, that flyover it goes up single line on the connector. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so what we what we've done is because it was a bit too much. Is I, I took 15 mil out and packed it 15 mil. And went in two weeks later, took another 15 mil out, packed another 15 mil. Um, yeah, I don't think they work. The only time they have worked is if it really is warped, like Bob says, if it is yeah, totally yeah. ruined and it's never going to move again. You know, if it's become like a fossilized, then then it might work. Is there any disagreement? Huh? Where do I get the books from? <laughs> How do you patent them? That's the question. <laughs> I've got a few left, but the, I think the, the printing company's moved. Will you charge for signing them as well? <laughs> right. Do you want the screen? I'll, start, I'll have the screen. Um, Mark, I need to start off with an apology um, because I didn't realise what a bad time you had when you first started with us at Rail Tractor. <laughs> <laughs> Apologise for all the crap that you had when you first started. Um, but it's good to know we've got the shoes knocked off at Barnes because I always uh, took some bollocking for that. <laughs> <laughs> Land some back. Uh, Mark, you said something at the end there where you mentioned confidence. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that you can instill on these teams. Competence is one thing, and knowing how to do it is one thing. Having the confidence to do it is a completely different thing. And, and going round to gangs in the way that I know that you do, 
Um, talking their language, which is really important, is a tremendous confidence giver. So I'd like to thank you for all the work that you've done for that. Um, a lot of it is the bleeding obvious, but there's an awful lot of detail uh, in what Mark goes into there. And it's a lot of detail that when you think of it, you think, yeah, that, that is bleeding obvious. Um, but it's the sort of thing that lots of people take for granted that everybody knows how they do it. And of course, until you go out with them, as Mark points out, you realise that not everybody does know how they do it. So I think what you've given us today is a tremendous enlightening view of what you've been doing over the last 20 years, because nobody really knows, Mark. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, you've, you've brought, you've brought the, the reality home to all of us that are watching on screen and uh, that here in the room of how difficult and challenging it is. But if you have it explained to you, um, you've given people the confidence on how to do it. And I, I think the numbers that you showed there speak for themselves. So thank you for what I think has been a tremendously interesting um, presentation and a great insight into what some think is a really basic thing, but actually is a lot more detailed than we appreciate and believe. So um, if I can ask everybody to congratulate Mark and thank Mark. And <laughs> Now, so no, that's, that's it. Really. Thank you. Can I just unclick it? Yeah, no, just, yeah, just leave the meeting. Um, okay. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, I'll get there in the end. I have to hit a few buttons normally. And for those of you who haven't been here before, and and, um, and the idea of a, of a post talk cold drink appeals to you. The Black Friday across the road is is very suitable for very suitable for that. Can be a bit busy, but certainly close. People can do that. Work.